yeah generally yeah. if you're if you like stem collecting or you uh go look for butterflies on the weekend no one cares and this is a butterfly collecting job and this is a butterfly <laughs> collecting job <laughs> I'm back. It's Expat Life Germany, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of expats. And this is the episode about finding and getting a job in Germany. Welcome to it. Now, as always, I have a corresponding blog post to this uh, this episode, which has a summary of a lot of the things we talk about. And in this case, you might want to check that one out because there's going to be a lot of resources there for you. A lot of URLs that I talk about, a lot of resources for finding jobs and so on. I will put that all into that blog post because it's too much for the show notes. You can find a link to that blog post in the show notes, but it is expatlifegermany.de forward slash finding a job in Germany. And that's finding minus a minus job minus in minus Germany. Or just click on the link in the show notes. Maybe better than typing it all out. Who types URLs out anymore? Who does that? No one does that. Now, what is in this episode? I have got a lot of stuff for you. First of all, I will go through some general ways to search for jobs in Germany. And then I discuss with Cheryl Howard of CherylHoward.com about her experiences. And believe me, she has had dozens of job interviews in Germany and possibly even hundreds of job interviews. So she has a lot of experience with us and I had a very good discussion with her, got a lot of good information that I think you can enjoy and use. After that, I discussed CVs and to help me with that, I've got Abby from imexpat.de coming in to help me again and she will explain what goes into a German CV and she'll give us some do's and don'ts. Then I have looked for jobs on three occasions myself in Germany. So I have some ideas and tips and advice to help to give you so uh, I will go into some of my experiences and discuss my stories of job searching and uh, there might be some tips in there for you in fact I've put together some tips from my experience in that section and then finally I read out some advice from our listeners and also some questions and I try to give some que answers to those questions and hopefully they're good enough answers and maybe they can help you as well. So it's a long one. Let's get started. Now, as much as I'd like this episode to solve all of your problems, it won't. There's just too many variables and too many situations to give a one size fits all solution. But what I want to do is talk about experiences, maybe give some tips and share my own experience. And hopefully somewhere in all of that, you'll find something that helps you in the right direction. It's also important to keep in mind that how you search for a job probably depends on the type of visa that you have. I go into some of the visa types in my interview with Cheryl Howard, which is coming up next. But here's the important thing. Requirements differ from state to state in Germany, first of all. Second of all, visa types and the requirements change from time to time. For example, there is now a blue card visa, which is a European visa that allows skilled workers to get a visa here in Germany. That would, that didn't exist a few years ago. So that's a new visa type. So I didn't, I didn't want to drill down too much into visa types in this episode because, as I said, they differ and they change from time to time. So what you need to do is do some research of your own into what visas allow you to do what. And you can do this by asking questions on Facebook groups or calling up your local visa offices. A good resource, by the way, for visa stuff is the Auswärtiges Amt. And I've placed a link to that in the show notes as well. So check that out if you want some more information on visas and how to get in to Germany. So when it comes to actually searching for jobs, there are dozens of job portals you can use to do a search online. The Probably the biggest resource for jobs available is the Bundesagentur Job Bursa, if that makes any sense. Kind of the job uh, repository, if you want to call it that, from, from the Bundesagentur. And uh, again, I know I've said this before, but I'm going to be saying it a few more times in this episode. The link is in the blog post that is associated with this episode. I link to the Job Bursa for the Arbeitsagentur.de. You can also search on LinkedIn and Zing.de. There's going to be more information about those two later on in this episode. Um, so there are dozens of other possibilities as well, like the, the big ones like Monster.de, Stepstone.de, Indeed.de. Uh, there's also German ones, Jobpilot.de, and many others. So I have put a list of just some of them also in the blog post. 
The problem with many of these is that they don't specifically provide English jobs, but uh, you can do certain things with your searches and or, or, or search for your job title in English and quite often you'll find the job that you're looking for in English. Uh, but you'll have to do some clicking around. This is not easy, folks. You got to do some work. You know what I'm saying? You got to do some work to get the work. There are also other options that can help with finding specifically English jobs. And I think of uh, sites like thelocal.de, which is a great resource, by the way, anyway. You should be looking at that for other things. Also sites like Expatica, and there are many others that offer specifically English-speaking jobs. The problem with these is it's very limited, and you probably want to use the bigger repositories and sources for searching for jobs, um, just because there's more options available there. Another thing about finding a job in Germany that you need to keep in mind is unsolicited applications. So if you want to work at a specific company, for example, if you're looking at uh, big international companies and you want to specifically work there, but there's not a job open for you yet, the great thing is a lot of them offer an opportunity on their website for you to provide an unsolicited application. And even if they don't, find an email address uh, for their HR department and send them your CV with a covering letter. And a lot of German companies take those unsolicited applications, put them on file, and when something comes up, then they, uh, they, they, um, they have you on file. And if they really like your, your CV or something about you, they may even create a, a, a position specifically aimed at you. So just try it out. If you're in the job market, send unsolicited applications as well. Now, to apply for jobs in Germany, you will have to have an up-to-date CV. And not just an up-to-date CV, but an up-to-date CV in German format. And I discussed that with Abby from imexpat.de a little later after the Cheryl Howard interview. Speaking of Cheryl Howard, she is up next. Cheryl Howard lives in Berlin and she runs the travel blog CherylHoward.com. The site has a lot of information about traveling and various other things, and it also has a lot of good advice for expats. Some of it is specific to Berlin, but a lot of it is applicable to expats anywhere in Germany. Now, I came across Cheryl Howard when I found an article about finding a job in Berlin. So I approached her. And I asked her if she was willing to come onto my podcast and talk about job hunting in Germany. And she was, she very graciously accepted. So I must also say that we had a lot of technical problems recording this interview. And Cheryl very happily hopped onto different recording platforms with me and once even restarted the entire interview from the beginning. So I, she couldn't have been nicer about it. And I am so grateful to Cheryl for sticking with it because she has some really good advice for job seekers. So here's Cheryl. I'm a Canadian from Toronto who's been located in Berlin since 2011. I had a brief two-year break where I went home to Canada, but it wasn't long after getting back home that I discovered that I really, really wanted to get back to Berlin. So I spent the next two years plotting my way back. And I've been back here since December of 2014. And I really came to Berlin just to um, start a new life and to chase some fresh new adventures and really do some hardcore traveling across Europe. And so my blog is mostly, mostly about that. So it's about travel in general, but especially to different places in Europe. And it has different um, destination features, um, sometimes photo diaries, sometimes um, travel guides about certain cities and, and things like that. And as well, I write a lot about um, kind of like life in Berlin, especially from a, a non-German or non-EU perspective. So we talk about things like how to find a job, ways that you can learn German and or where to learn and a lot, a lot of detailed information about the different things you need to consider when you move here. Yeah, there's there's a lot of content on that. I spent quite a bit of time just going through the different menu options and lot lot lots of stuff to find there. So to come to the to more to the job search, which is what this episode is actually focused on. The reason I found you was basically I was looking for job advice and looking at uh, other expat issues, and I came across your article about finding a job in Berlin. And you're no stranger to searching for a job in Germany, specifically Berlin. So. Maybe tell tell us a bit about yeah. your job search experiences and what it is that you do right now. So yeah, um, I think the the first thing that's really important to to think about in Berlin is that like it's it's the capital of Germany and it's also kind of like home to 
a lot of startups and a lot of tech companies. So um, I, my career has been in tech. So my experience at, of finding a job in Berlin um, has never really been that challenging because I guess we're living in this time where um, that if you work in tech and you speak English and you work in a career that's in demand, like you almost don't have to search because people are, are coming to you. Um, it's, it's kind of something I, I never experienced until the past few years. Um, so like the context can be very different for depending on the career that you have or the specialization that you have. Um, but like some things that helped me was um, when I moved back here the first time, I already knew some people from the first time I was here. So like having a little bit of a network certainly helped to connect to um, different opportunities. You know, even in startups that went out of business and had to find a new job. And um, that was definitely a more mixed experience because even if you're getting a lot of contacts um, coming in, um, getting past the interview process and like competing against other candidates can be a different experience. So um I've had job interviews where it just didn't go well because the the way that they constructed the process, like, you know, there's sometimes you have to do a trial day and spend the whole day in the office practicing doing things mm -hmm. um, and they can be exhausting. And yeah. uh, so you have all these like different types of experiences and then the other ones are like super awesome and you you meet lots of people and you talk to all these um, yeah, you talk to, maybe you talk to the CTO of a company or the founder, and then you also talk with the teams that you meet and you speak with the HR people. And so you have all these different experiences. And like I found in more recent years that it's getting harder, but like, it's also the challenging, the challenge is really good, good for you yeah. in like learning. And, um, yeah, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a mixed bag, but I think again depending on your profession you can have like really different experiences but definitely if you work in tech um you have the advantage at the moment yeah tech tech is definitely in demand you said that uh it's become more difficult in recent times or you've noticed that that it's become more de uh, more difficult in what ways and how, and what do you think is is making it so difficult well I think like, you know, like say, for example, you're a software engineer, you can find a job, like you can easily quit your job and find a new job the next day. But there, there, there's always lots of other people competing against you. So that's definitely a thing. And especially if you're coming from abroad and you don't know German, depending on the company you're applying for, language can definitely be a barrier. Another one can be cultural fit, and this really, really depends on the company. So younger, younger startups, for example, are usually very filled with other international people, mm. so the, the fit could be easier. But yeah. if you're taking someone, Canada, the U.S., Australia, somewhere that's completely different, and then you're working for a more traditional German company, there might not always be that right fit between you. Mm. And then also just knowing how to act in the job interviews. So it's kind of a good idea to um, how people act in job interviews here and the right things to do or the right things to say. And you, you can't always know, but just trying to be aware of certain things can certainly be helpful. Yeah. Um, like yeah, what certain then, things, for example? Um, well, like if you work for a startup, for example, um, maybe you wouldn't want to overdress because yeah. if you showed up in a suit, it would probably just feel super weird and people would be like, who is this person <laughs> dressed up in a, <laughs> in a business suit? Like regardless of if you're male or female, it would just feel really weird, especially like when the, maybe like the founders or the C-levels of the company are just sitting there in t-shirts and yeah. jeans. Yeah. Maybe like, you know, taking a look at the company website and trying to get a feel for their culture because usually on the, the job listings page, they'll usually be trying to kind of promote how their culture is, that they play a lot of uh, ping pong or they mm. have beer nights once a week. Um, so you can kind of get a feeling, but maybe if you're going for a bigger corporate, then maybe dressing up would be a good idea. You uh, you mentioned some bad experiences that you've had in the past and where it didn't feel right or something was not, was just off with the interviews and uh, then some other times where it was awesome to meet people. Wh which which of those jobs did you get? Did you ever land up in a job that where it was a strange interview or did those ones generally end badly? 
So I work as an agile coach and I, I help coach teams um, to be better at agile and other processes. And so because an agile coach isn't like a usual job. Um, they can really <laughs> push your limits during um, interviews or trial days because they want to see how you act under stress or right. how you respond to certain situations. And um, so my experiences have been all over the map, but one company, they brought me in for a day and I had different interviews all day. And then I had to practice running certain types of meetings with like actual real teams. And then they also made me do this presentation for them. And they also gave you limited time to prepare. So it was wow. a really, really nerve wracking experience. And then I had to present and I had to present to this huge room full of people with like some also really high level, high up people. Yeah. And uh, some of them were so tough on me and I was like, wow, this, these guys are, are kind of intense. And I was sweating and like, I thought, oh, wow, like that, that interview was, was terrible. And like, I didn't get the job. <laughs> and then what I didn't know is like, they were purposely kind of poking me a little bit just to see how I would handle myself. And I didn't know that until later. <laughs> and um, actually, I got a job offer the next day. So <laughs> there was um, one time that I was searching for a job and got very far into the process. And I think I had about three or four interviews and I had been into the office once and I, I had actually thought that I had did really well. And um, it, it turns out that I didn't, and they never really gave me feedback as to why I didn't get the job and they turned me down, which was okay. And it's something that happened. Sure. But what was really, really funny is that the day after they rejected me, they sent me an email asking me if I was interested in working for them and would I like to come into, <laughs> into the office for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the recruiting team was um, probably under a bit of stress and overwhelmed and it was definitely a sign that I it was probably not the place to work and I'm glad that I probably escaped a possibly bad situation with them yeah that sounds like I think that sounds like there's some warning bells over there yes so um I don't know if you maybe you can tell us something about visas that people what, what visa options are there for people coming to Germany without a job? So definitely for people um, who aren't from the EU, so like non-EU citizens, um, you can definitely start with a tourist visa. So you're not allowed to work with a tourist visa, but you can be here for three months and you can actually be here and apply for companies and um, try to get interviews and Hopefully within those three months, you can get an offer and like make an application for like a regular visa that's tied to your job. So right. that's definitely one option. Um, another popular one that a lot of people don't seem to know about it at times, but you can also apply for a job seeker visa, which will allow you to stay up for six months. And like the tourist visa, you can't work while you have that visa, but you can be here for the sole purpose of trying to find a job. So it gives you okay. a little bit more time. Is that open only um, to specific kinds of jobs or is it open to anyone? I think it's open to anyone. Maybe it's, it could be country specific, but I, I do know a number of um, people from like outside of the EU who use a job seeker visa as okay. like a bridge to getting a more permanent position. Okay, so one of the other visas is like the working holiday visa. I think some people also call it um, a youth mobility visa, which if you're from certain countries, I don't remember all the countries, but definitely it's like Canada, Australia, Japan, and then maybe a few others. But if you're under 35, you can come to Germany and live here for a year and there's different categories that you can apply, but one of them is that you can come here and, and work. So under the working holiday visa, you can actually live and work in Germany for up to a year. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, if you do get a job offer from a company, you can also get like a regular visa or if you're a specialized person who has like a profession that's in demand, you can apply for the blue card, which gives you um, some nice perks. How did you do it? What visa did you come on? Um, so the first time I came here, I used the working holiday visa and, um, yeah, I, I did some freelancing during that first year. Um, I actually am now not sure if you're allowed to freelance when you have a working holiday visa, but it seemed to be 
okay when I was here because I was still able to register for tax numbers and do all sorts of different things. Right. Um, and then after the working holiday visa expired, I applied for a freelance visa and I, I freelanced for a couple of companies around Berlin for another year or so. And then after I came back to Berlin, after of living in Canada for a while, I actually just came on a, on a blue card. And um, last year I actually got my permanent residency. Okay. That's quite a, quite a journey to get here. <laughs> exactly. I, I've had like every visa, it feels like. <laughs> You mentioned that you you were a freelancer. So for those for a lot of people struggling to find jobs in Germany, freelancing could well be an option that they could turn to. So what what do you need to get started in Germany as a freelancer? So like off the top of my head, um, definitely you have to have proof of things like that you have health insurance and that you have at least like um, some kind of income coming in or some kind of reoccurring income stream as well as like a certain amount of money in the bank. Um, and at some point I think you need also like a tax number. So it's just kind of this list of things that you have to tick off. But generally, if you can show that you have at least more than one client, I think they don't want you to have only one client Yeah, because it, it seems like you have too much dependence on like a single company. If you can show like a variation um, or have some letters from some of those companies stating that they're working with you. It generally, um, if you have all those things put together, you, most people are generally successful at getting a freelance visa. Now, you often hear people saying that it's easier for English speakers to find English jobs in the big cities like Berlin and Munich and Frankfurt. Is this true? And how important is it for job seekers to learn German maybe before they come? Is it something that they need to do or... Are they, can they just wing it on English? Um, I think in Berlin, you can wing it on just English um, because it's something that I've done and I, I know a lot <laughs> of other people who've done it as well. But I think, again, with just for myself personally, working in tech and for startups, if you're kind of in that world, it's a little bit easier. But I would say that maybe in other cities, even like Munich or Frankfurt, um, it's probably to a lesser extent and German becomes more important there. And then actually the numbers of, I, I forget where I read it, but I read it somewhere online. And, and it is true that most um, companies, especially really like medium to small size businesses will absolutely require that, you know, German and you, you can't just have cafe level of German where you're ordering a beer or a coffee. Right. Like you have to be able to speak at a, a very, very professional high level. Otherwise, the, the companies may not want to hire you. So I think it, it really, really depends. And especially if you're in like um, professions that are like outside of tech, like if you're, or yeah. if you're working for a more traditional company, mm -hmm. at least in my humble opinion, I think learning German is like absolutely critical. And like if someone's serious about moving to Germany to get here, but to really start putting in the effort long before you do get here. Yeah. And I, I think that it's changing because Berlin or like Germany itself does need to hire more skilled workers from yeah. abroad as the population ages, but yeah. it's probably better now than it was five years ago. But I think the change will be slow, especially if you're in the cities out, or if you're in places outside the major cities. Yeah. Kind of on that topic, you've, you've worked for several startups. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that being an option. Is, is a startup a good option for expats? And what are the pros and cons of working at a startup or looking for a job rather at startups? Um, yeah, so I think startups are a great place to get work experience. But yeah, there's office, obviously like pros and cons. Um, so if you're working for a startup of something bigger, and like maybe you have to fill like one or two or even three different roles. So like you're wearing a bunch of different hats and you, you could really get a lot of really good work experience and, you know, taking the company into the future. So um, it can be like a, a ride or die kind of story because, you know, startups are always looking for their next round of funding and they may or may not survive. So that, that can be really intense, but also really fun. But as well, startups tend to attract a lot of young talent, um, um, a lot of really fun people. They have a lot of social events. So you'll have fun areas where you can play ping pong or uh, kicker or something like that. And then um, like the company that I work for right now, they have uh, 
a social event every Friday where we sit around and drink beer and just like have a nice time. And we also have a lot of other social outings. So that's also really, really fun. And it's also very international. So the company I work at now is people from like more than 70 nations. So um, that is like really, really, really cool. But Of course, then there's downsides. Um, Less mature companies can definitely be more chaotic because they don't really have process. Um, Mm -hmm. You also could have a lot of people, like even including the founders who don't really know what they're doing and might not even know like certain basic laws to follow in certain situations. So Mm -hmm. there is a tenant for not know how to handle an episode of sexual harassment. I, I've seen where they're like firing somebody for being sick too much, which isn't really something that you can do without following certain steps. Yeah. Um, so it it can be really intense. And, you know, like I've worked for a startup that, that went out of business and suddenly wasn't able to pay our salary. And that was a really, really stressful and nerve wracking experience wow. um, where I went in debt for a while just to pay my bills while I was waiting for everything else to come in. So that's kind of not a fun part. So I think in my first two years back in Berlin, I worked at three different places because I kept working for companies that were like (laughs) either downsizing or totally going out of business. But um, finally, I found a really good home where I am now. So I'm very happy. And I guess that's just it. That's just it. It's just sticking with it and kind of making sure your skills are up to date. And I think if, especially if you're working for startups where, you know, that could happen next month where things are, things are going to change in a second, then you just make sure your CV is up to date and you're, you're keeping yeah. your skills. <laughs> Uh, get really good at job interviews. <laughs> you're honing that skill really, really well. Yeah. Do you know how many, I, in ballpark figure, how many job interviews have you been to? Do you have any idea? Some. Sometimes when I was on the job search, I was interviewing with five or six different companies at once. So I'm sure more than a hundred different interviews for sure. More than a hundred. Wow. No, maybe that's too much, but uh, it was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> but that just goes to show, just keep trying people. Cause I often see on these Facebook groups and the forums, people are saying, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm just not finding anything, but you just got to keep going and putting, putting your application out there somewhere. And, and it might be the fact that you can't be too picky and you just got to kind of get in at the ground level and say, okay, I'll take a step back even in my career. Right. Yeah. I know of some people who move here without a job and then realizing, realize exactly what we're talking about, that it's, it's going to take a bit of time to actually find a job. But of course you have living expenses and you also mentioned losing a job because the company went bankrupt. And then you had to cover your expenses for a period of time. What, what, what advice do you have for expats to kind of cover their costs while they're searching? Yeah, like I think especially if you're making such a big change in your life and you're doing something like I did coming from Canada to Germany, um, that you definitely bring a, a saving, like give yourself a certain amount of time to be here, like three months or six months and have enough money to cover that. You really have to have that money in the bank to make sure that you're going to be okay and to make sure that you're going to be able to to pay your rent um, while you're searching for a job or even just um, having that buffer in case you lose your job is always a, a really good idea. And then, yeah, like just um, for some other tips when you're when you're searching for a job, I think like persistence is really key. And I say in one of my articles that searching for a job is almost a job in itself. Yeah. So having a good way to track all the companies that you've applied for and like where you, where you're at in the stage, like at, where you're at in the different stages. Yeah. Um, I had a spreadsheet where I used to keep track of a lot of stuff and it was kind of like the only way to stay sane. Um, yeah. And like even following up with companies at times, like maybe not ones that you haven't heard back from, but at least ones that you've been in interview processes with. And then maybe also, um, this is a a thing for me, especially when I was interviewing a lot. And I think most, I was pretty successful at getting offers, but I also got a lot of rejections. And I think one of the key things is if you are getting interviews, but you're not getting the job is to like try to ask for feedback and not all companies will give it. But when you get it to kind of be humble enough to receive that feedback and kind of like adjust yourself and learn from it, it will like guarantee you a better chance of success. Yeah. And yeah, I think maybe one last tip is to maybe um, like say, for example, you want to get a job as like a project manager. 
um, definitely apply for those kind of jobs, but like maybe if you can find some jobs that are closely related and you might be interested in as well, I don't think it hurts to apply for them either. Yeah. Um, because there are certain jobs where they will take you without a lot of experience if you show like a lot of promise. So I would say people shouldn't limit themselves to like something very specific. Um, and you never know where these things lead you anyway. So you get in, you get in in one yes. position and you might end up where you want to be, or maybe you find out that you like doing what you end up doing. So it's really just being open and flexible to go with whatever happens. Yes. Cheryl, that's, uh, that's, this is all great advice. I think this is very useful. And I think that a lot of expats that listen to this will feel like they can relate very much to what you've been saying. So thank you very much for coming on to give your advice. And people can find you at CherylHoward.com. Yes. And I see that you've got there links to your uh, social media accounts. So it's kind of like the hub for Cheryl Howard. You go there and you can find all that, all that information, especially if you're in Berlin, check it out. But there's also a lot of general information that's not just about Berlin. So check out CherylHoward.com and have a look at all, all the content that she's got up there. Cheryl, thank you very much. Thank you. I can personally get behind Cheryl's advice about looking for work at startups. I personally have worked at two myself. Now, actually, they, I guess calling them startups might be a bit of a misnomer. They, by the time when that, when I joined them, they just passed the startup phase and, you know, they'd kind of reached the, the, the 150 person point and they were expanding pretty quickly. So I guess startup strictly speaking is not what they were at that point but they still had that mentality of a startup and uh, things like lots of cool stuff for the employees like table tennis video game consoles and so on and a very very relaxed working atmosphere and it's an atmosphere that really is suited to me for one and I think is a lot of fun to working for a lot of different personality types so I, I can very very definitely recommend the startup route uh, especially because as Cheryl says they're looking for English speakers they're very international they're very dynamic um, so a very cool experience so now that we've discussed a bit about what kind of jobs to look for and the interviews it's now time to look at the most important part of your job application it's your curriculum vitae your Lebenslauf your resume uh, IamExpat.de has a great guide to writing a CV, and I asked Abby, who has been on the podcast before, to come on the show and give us an explanation about it. First of all, I think the biggest question is, what should be in a CV? What are uh, Arbeitgeber, or what, I can't remember the English word now, uh, employers, employers. Good, Ex- right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been in Germany too long. Um, yeah. <laughs> what should they, ex- what, are they, what are they expecting in a CV? So, with a German CV... It's not hugely different from what you expect anywhere else. But I mm-hmm. think there are a few things that maybe are slightly different to how you, what you might be used to in your home country. And getting it right is really important because if a recruiter sees a CV that's not exactly in the style that they're expecting, it's going to end up in the bin probably, yeah. which is unfortunate. But it's important to know that... English speaking jobs in Germany, even though they are out there, there is very high competition. So making a few kind of small changes can have a really big impact on Mm -hmm. how well your job search does. And recruiters commonly flick through hundreds and hundreds of CVs for a single job. So it's very, very important to get it right. So I would say probably the main difference, especially, so I'm from the UK and we like to uh, do a lot of small talk and bumble and uh, waffle a lot into things. So the biggest shock for me was that CVs in Germany are just facts. Like yeah. we don't, they don't like uh, buzzwords or business jargon or embellishment on your skills. It should be a very, very simple fact sheet, which mm-hmm. lists your education, your experience and a bit about you. So... In terms of a structure, the probably most common one that uh, people would follow is to have a section that just includes your personal information. So, yeah, the obvious things, your name, your date of birth, your nationality, and some of your contact information. Mm -hmm. Get your phone number right. I have in the past put the wrong phone number on a CV and uh, I managed to get the job actually, but they took, it took them a while to get in contact with me. So, uh, 
that was not my proudest moment. No, that's um, maybe uh, maybe a warning signs for an employer if someone can't get their, yeah, their phone I number right. That, I think I think that I'm actually quite surprised that they even tried <laughs> to track me down. Uh, I would not, but yeah. Um, another thing that's maybe different, we don't have this in the UK, uh, is the passport size photo. So it's quite yeah. common to attach a photo to the top of your uh, of your CV. I found that very not- strange. I think it's weird as well. So weird. Very weird. I believe yeah. that you don't have to. It's not like uh, I, I, some people opt not to do it. But I, I yeah. think generally the pr- the practice is most people when they're filling out their CVs, they, they do include the photograph. So I think you probably want to put one on there regardless of how you feel about it. If you're looking for a job, it probably helps to have it on there. Yeah, I, I find it quite strange, but yeah. it's sort of a, a, a normal thing to do and so sort of not attaching a photo might be something that makes your cv stand out and yeah. not necessarily in a good way yeah. but yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, or that's... or if you're sending your cv with your photo attached and you're not getting any office maybe remove the photo and then oh help. yeah maybe <laughs> or ask someone else for their opinion of your photo yeah, or that... maybe use a picture of someone else just to yeah. trick them i don't know yeah i think uh, i think maybe on that on that photo point as well i, I think the the important thing to remember is it should be a, a, a professional shot as well it shouldn't just be For sure yeah uh, uh, Facebook uh, drinking with the friends having cocktails on Friday night yeah no keep the beers out of the picture Maybe yeah there's... there we go that's the quote for the episode <laughs> keep the beers out of the picture keep the beers out of the picture yeah <laughs> Um, so then moving down the CV the second section is going to be about your education so uh, the most important things to include in that would be details about your secondary and higher education so if you went to university where did you go and what program did you study people sometimes also include uh, information about different modules that they took uh, during the course of their degree or at school that might be relevant to the position so you know, but again, the most important thing is to keep it relevant. So yeah. if you're applying for a, a job as an accountant, they're not interested in, in your drama, you know, yeah. class that you did at no. undergraduate. No. But things that are part- pertinent to the job position, then it's always worth throwing in. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you want any prizes or whatever at university, then you could also list that there. But okay. keep it keep it to the point. And then your third section is about work experience. So normally you would start with your most recent position and then work backwards in chronological order. I think it really depends on uh, how you want to do it. Some people will literally keep it very, very factual. And, you know, these are my responsibilities in all of the jobs that I did. Uh, I've heard... Um, another sort of app way that you could try it is a more of a skills-based CV. So including within your work experience, kind of your the skills that that job, mm. you know, used. Yeah. Or there are other versions where you can kind of outline your main achievements in the role, okay. um, things that you're proud of. But yeah. again, I think the most important thing for the work section is to keep it to the fact. So this was my job. This is what I did. And this is what I achieved. I don't want, they don't want to hear, you know, I'm the best salesman this side yeah. of uh, New York or, yeah. yeah Germ- that, the Germans I don't, don't like that. Well. No, won't go down well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I had the most success with CVs that were really, when I was sending them, I was thinking there's not enough information on there. And especially yeah. in this work section where it was literally just a bullet, bullet point where I said, this is what I did in this role. And it was a few mm. words. And those were the CVs that, um, yeah. for me, worked the best. So clearly, yeah, clearly they like the brevity. I, I've i had the same experience. I, I used to have a very wordy CV. Mm. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm quite a wordy yeah. person. Uh, <laughs> and I wasn't getting much success. So I scaled it right back and I cut it right down to literally the bare bones of mm. the facts. And from there, I've sort of, I've had a lot more uh, yeah, responses because I think, I think it's sort of letting your skills and your experience speak for themselves. You yeah. don't have to dress it up if they're good enough and you're exactly. good enough for the role. Yeah. And I think, again, it's about thinking, again, the fact that they're scanning multiple CVs at once. And so if it just looks like a big solid block of text, yeah. personally, I, I wouldn't read it. No, the, no. We'll I, I would scan it. You'd scan it. So yeah. it's sort of helping yeah. their eyes. Um, so, yeah. I think as well, the what you're trying to do with a CV is just give them things that they want to talk to you about. So it, it, it yeah. might be that the less information that you provide, the better, because they see the point and they go, oh, I'd love to talk to them about that because that could mm-hmm. translate to something good here in this job. Yeah. So I think just rather put yeah. bullet points that's gonna that, that will entice them to want to know more rather than give too much information. 
A hundred percent. So then there's a final section that you can add onto your CV. Again, I would I would say see this as an optional section. Um, so it's a kind of opportunity for you to list any, they call it the other skills or achievements in the German Zonstiges. So it's a kind of a list of all of your other qualifications, achievements, or anything that's relevant. Not like... You know, I love windsurfing and I like going to the cinemas on win- on Wednesday. I love books about really the popular. sea and long Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not, <laughs> I, I don't think, I've heard that uh, German CVs generally think that personal hobbies and interests, like they don't care. Yeah. They really, really no, they don't. care less. Yeah. But, <laughs> so instead, sort of, I would focus on things like computer skills. I don't know if you've done a coding course, uh, language abilities, if you've got certification, maybe the fact that you have a driving license. Things like that maybe would be yeah best yeah. rather than uh, your hobbies because no one cares. No one cares. I'm afraid uh, your friends and your family and maybe. everyone cares, but maybe the hiring manager maybe <laughs> the hiring manager does not care about your no. hobbies or your pets. Unless it's anything. directly um, related to your job, of course. That's the, that's that's I, I think pretty obvious because for me, for example, if I'm in content marketing and I have a blog or a podcast, let's say, hypothetically speaking, mm-hmm. that might be of interest to content marketing. So Definitely, that, that's different. Yeah. But yeah, generally, yeah. if you're if you like stamp collecting, or you uh, go look for butterflies on the weekend, no one cares. Unless it's a butterfly collecting job. Unless it's a butterfly <laughs> collecting job. <laughs> you know, what it is? butterfly collecting jobs. In, in which case, I don't think you're gonna have too much problem getting the job because I should imagine there's not too much. Uh, <laughs> not much competition. No. In fact, that's the advice from this session: just look for butterfly collecting jobs and put that in your hobby yeah. collection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, but we digress. The question is: uh, Do you write this in Germany? Do you write the CV in German or English? That's a very good question. I would say if your language ability is up to it, if you speak good enough German, and especially if the job description is in German or you're likely to be working in German, do it in German because, yeah, you know, you don't want to make it stand out in a bad way, like I've said. Yeah. But on the other hand, if it's an English speaking role or the, the job, de, the sort of job description might call for your CV to be in English, um, then it's it's perfectly fine to write it in English. I think the other thing to consider as well is you don't want to give a false impression of your German language ability. So if you, you know, it's obviously much easier to at home spend a long time perfecting the German on your CV and send it off. But then when they call you up for an interview and you can't even respond to, you know, what's your name? It might be, it might be seen as misleading the, the hiring manager. Yeah. So I think, Especially, even if it is an English-speaking role, generally in German, having German language ability will give you an edge over other yeah. candidates because, yeah, it's it's the language of business, even if companies are starting to adapt slightly yeah. more and they're still starting to be a bit more English language, yeah. you know, jobs and things. Generally, being able to speak German is a good thing and showing that off in your CV is a good thing. Yeah. But you don't want to mislead anyone no, and right. give the impression that your German is flawless when it's not. Yeah. Yeah, what I've done is... It's a hard one, yeah. I it's think tough. It, yeah, it's tough. Because you because, want to impress them. You want to, you want them to understand what you're mm, writing to them, but you, like you, say, yeah. you also don't want to mislead them. So it's a, it's a difficult decision to make. For sure. Like my my German is is good. I can work in German, but I, I never feel as comfortable expressing myself in German as I do in English. Exactly. And when it's something like you're with your C V or even cover letters, you're trying to it's very it's quite uh, it's personal. Yeah. And it feels difficult to try and do it in another language. But I, yeah, I think if you can do. Yes. If you can't do there we go. That's it. Good advice. Yeah. Um what I what I've done in the past is um kept my C V English, but Generally, you have to provide a cover letter that covers specific aspects of the job and kind of just mm-hmm. uh, motivating why you're applying and, and so on. That I that I have done in German in the past, but in that letter, mm-hmm. um, so I've had a German help me write it so that it's grammatically correct and so on. But in mm-hmm. that letter, I state my German is not good. So, but I stated in very good German that someone helped me with. So that that kind of <laughs> <laughs> that, I've done that. That worked. That was my first job. I think I got my first job with the German cover letter, but. Since then, yeah. since then, I've actually kept it English, but I have the I have the advantage that my work has always been in English. I, I, yeah. I you know, I kind of write blogs and uh, make YouTube videos and so on, and that's all in English. So, yeah, that's 
that's fine for me. But I think it also depends if if you're applying for a German job and your German is not that good, you might want to put the cover letter in German so that they understand and they they um, know what the deal is. And yeah, what other tips do you have, Abby? Ooh, okay. So I think my main things would be to keep it factual. Yeah. So get rid of the waffle, get rid of the fluff. It doesn't help. Um, I think keep it as streamlined as you possibly can. So some people tend to uh, put their all of their jobs down from, you know, the the after school job they had delivering newspapers mm. right up until the present day. So sort of 10, 15, 20 years of work experience isn't helpful. Just sort of streamline it with the ones that are relevant to what you're applying to. Yeah. Um, keep it short. Again, I don't think any longer than two pages. If you can keep it on one side, that is brilliant, but two maximum, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. No one's going to scan through more than that. Try and make it visually appealing as well. It's weird. So actually, interestingly, uh, for the last couple of years now, I've been on the other side of the of the table okay in terms of interviewing yeah. and scanning cvs and it's been like the most eye-opening experience ever imagine. going through cvs and it's weird how i guess it is a personal thing as well but some of them you look at them and you just think i don't want to read that it's, it's bizarre and i never thought that it could make such a difference but it instantly makes you sort of not like the person um so but you see i've seen so many different cv layouts and some people get really really creative with it mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of uh, websites where you can use templates yeah. and uh, and just make it visually appealing as well. We mentioned this before, but uh, bullet points are much better than paragraphs. Yeah. Again, people people's eyes are lazy. No one wants to read long no. long blocks of text. Yeah. So bullet points are a really nice way of breaking things up. Um, and also, it's obviously a bit more time consuming, but um, having everyone obviously has one kind of generic CV, but I would recommend adjusting it slightly for different roles that you apply for in order to highlight certain parts of your experience and skills to really tailor your CV yeah. and your the same way you would do with a cover letter, do it to your CV as well to make it relevant to the job you're applying to. Um, and the most obvious one, but one that you might forget about is to be careful about typos and linguistic errors double check it triple check it quadruple check it mm. and then get someone else to check it as well yeah. because nothing looks as sloppy as having a typo in the first line yeah. or forgetting to put your own phone number down correctly <laughs> 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 so i should have taken my own advice yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting what you say about uh, the visually appealing. What would turn you off Im instantly when you – do you have an example of when you look at a CV and you see it, is it like that they've used different fonts or that the, the, the information's everywhere? Yeah, having a lot of uh, different – so either having all of the text exactly the same and kind of like squished up so there's no like – there's no paragraph breaks right. or um, using bold to sort of separate sections and like almost the way you would do with like, uh, you know, uh, headlines and then uh, subtitles and, you know, yeah. things like that to just break it up a bit. Yeah. Um, I've seen CVs where the the background was blue and all the writing was white, <laughs> which was, uh, you instantly go, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> like that hurt I my can't eyes. deal with it. Um, yeah, or um, ones that have, I think some people do try and use sort of super jazzy formats yeah. to try and make it stand out from the rest, but sometimes it really doesn't work. So, uh, I've seen ones as well where kind of there's a sort of bar of information all down the side, which is, which works well with the, the kind of personal information, mm -hmm. but then they had it in kind of like four blocks on like a, on a sort of vertically, uh, orientated page right. if that makes sense yeah. so it was like landscape and then they had four blocks so oh, yeah. it was just too much going on it looked very like busy um i think the kind of cleaner and tidier it looks the better yeah you don't want to sort of assault people's eyes no with the, yeah you, you're yeah. kind of walking a tightrope because you do want to make it stand out visually but you also don't uh -huh. want to go to the other end of the extreme where you're turning yeah. people off because your your formatting or your whatever is is out so yeah keep it as simple as possible i guess but just just try and um yeah it's difficult, but get feedback from yeah. people around you. And also, if you're yeah, sending out that CV to 10, 15 different companies and you're really getting nothing back or just rejections, then it might be time to take a look at a different format and just try something definitely. different. 
Yeah. I would say general rules of things to avoid would be jazzy fonts. Yeah. So just stick to something normal. Stick to like, comic sense. Yeah. Not Comic Sans, no. <laughs> no, definitely. Just to be clear, people, not Comic Sans ever, not, not on CVs or anything. Ever. It's not appropriate for <laughs> any kind of professional life. Um, and colors, like the text should be black. Okay. I think, yeah. yeah. Good. Maybe I'm just a square, but yeah. No, I think I think that is a very common thing. People people are busy. They've got a lot of CVs coming in. They want to get to the point. They want to see what the, what you've got to offer, and that's it. And anything that gets in the way of that is causing uh, causing problems for you. So yeah, I guess sure. keep it simple. Yeah, and like you mentioned before, we have the the CV guide on the, the IMX yes. website. If you want to take a look at, um, there's more information, and there's also a uh, links to some other websites where you can have your CV checked by professionals. Yeah, things like that. So there's lots of resources out on the internet as well to, to for CVs. Yeah. Help. Yeah. Yes, and there's a lot of other information on IMExpat.de as well. So go definitely go and check that out. Lots of stuff for expats. Abby, thank you so much for joining and giving advice. I think this was very useful and uh, hopefully it can help some people. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the show, I've been a job seeker in Germany several times before. I think it's about three times, in fact. That means I have some advice from my own job applications to give, and I've put together a, a whole bunch of points that I wanted to bring up as uh, maybe maybe something that could help you. But before I get to that, I wanted to tell you about my own job search stories. So when I arrived in Germany, I wanted to make a career change. And this is one of the greatest things about starting a new life in a new country, is that it's a great chance to try and reinvent yourself. You can do it on a personal level, but you can also do it on a professional level. And at that time, I'd been in a job in Johannesburg that had been soulless for me for, for many years. I was fairly good at it, but uh, I, I wanted to do something more creative. I'd studied marketing. I wanted to move in that direction. And when I moved to Germany, I thought to myself, this is the opportunity to finally move into something more creative and move away from the more business stuff that I was doing previously. The problem is, though, you can't be too picky about the jobs when you're applying in a new country. So what I did was I applied for the jobs that I really wanted, those uh, creative type of marketing jobs and other kinds of jobs. But I also applied for jobs in the same field as I'd been before. And I also applied for other jobs in between, just in the hope that I would get something. And one of the jobs I printed out and put it on my desk, but it said in the job specification that they wanted someone who had fluent German. So I'd kind of written that one off in my mind and I thought, I'm not even going to bother with that one. And eventually it passed the deadline date. And at, at some point during my job search, I just got so desperate that I, I kind of looked at that lying on my desk and I thought, you know what, what the hell? I'll put together a covering letter. I will put together, I'll send them my CV and who knows what could happen. And guess what? They wanted me for an interview. So I was, first of all, surprised that it was past the uh, the uh, apply-by date and that I didn't have fluent German, and I was very open and honest about that, and they still wanted to, wanted to see me for an interview, and it was very exciting. The interview was in Frankfurt. I got dressed up in trousers, which I never do, and a jacket and a tie. I was like fully interview mode going to a very large company in Frankfurt, and uh, off I went on the train. I was living in Schweinfurt at the time, and it's about a three-hour train drive from Schweinfurt to Frankfurt. And some point on that trip, I don't know exactly when it happened, but I was, you know, I was sitting in the train, going through my notes. I'd studied up on the company. I'd done, a, done my research online, and I was sitting in the train, and I, I looked down for some reason, and I saw my trousers right in the crotch area had been completely ripped open. I have no idea where this happened or how it happened. It wasn't like that when I left home. So at some point I ripped my trousers and didn't even know that I'd done it. And I was on the way to one of the biggest interviews of my life. I had said, if I don't get a job within a year, I'm leaving Germany. And I was like, oh my God, I, get, I have to go to the interview with ripped pants. So it was very difficult sitting in an interview knowing that my pants were ripped. And as it was, I was sitting very prone kind of so I just crossed my legs and I had to remember not to uncross them because it would be a bit like that basic instinct uh scene with Sharon Stone where she kind of like yeah um yeah I'm I'm not sure that would have gotten me the job 
let's put it that way. I had bright red underwear on that day, so it would have been fairly noticeable. So it's difficult to have something like that on your mind at the same time as trying to impress people in an interview. But that was what happened with my first real job interview at a big company in Frankfurt. And somehow, 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 I got the job. It was amazing. So that was my first job. Uh, that was me getting my first job, and it was a, as a technical writer, which was more in line with the field that I wanted to move into, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but it was, you know, I've always considered myself to be a good writer, so it was at least moving in the general direction of where I wanted to go. I worked at that company for nine years. I had a great time. I met some people that, I, that I, I'm still friends with today. It was a very international company, and it was really the, the perfect landing spot for me uh, as an expat, still learning German, and that experience was incredible. And then I, I applied for a second job in Germany, which I was also fortunate enough to get. As I mentioned earlier, it was at a smaller startup. And finally, um, not so long ago, I made a third job change and completely changed careers to content marketing, which is something that is way, way more suited to what I want to do and who I am as a person. So it's been a great journey here in Germany and it's provided me with opportunities that I might not have had had I stayed in Johannesburg. I don't know. It could have been that I stayed in the same career that I was in. I'd already built up some experience. I had some contacts and it could have been that I just remained there forever. So it was it was a good opportunity moving to Germany to really branch out and reinvent myself and land up where I am now. So through my three interviews, I gathered some experience about searching for jobs. So here are some of my points about finding work in Germany. I'm just going to throw them out there and I hope it helps someone out there. Keep trying is one of the biggest bits of advice that I have. In the beginning, my job applications were literally disappearing into the void. I wasn't even getting rejections, which is kind of even worse I would have preferred to get rejections, but I, would, I was just getting nothing. So I wasn't even sure that uh, my email was working. I was just hearing nothing. And yet I still kept on sending the applications out. And then, as I said, one of them eventually came back. And I found that later on, maybe it was because I had more experience on my CV or I, my German was better, but I had better luck when I sent out my CVs. But at that point in time, it was at least a three-month period or a four-month period where I wasn't getting any response whatsoever. So keep trying. My next bit of advice is if a job description specifies that they want fluent German as well as English, but you don't have your German up to speed, just enter anyway. What have you got to lose? You know, you, you, the worst the worst case scenario is they, they write back and say, no, sorry, we, we need fluent German. The job ad for my first German job, as I said, the reason I almost didn't apply for it was that it said German was a necessity. So I just almost didn't apply. And in the end, it didn't matter. And I got the job. So just try it anyway. You, if you're, Especially if you're desperate, just send those applications out. Another thing that I can suggest is write a different cover letter for each job that you apply to. And why I say that is that they need to see that you specifically tailored your application to that job. It kind of makes it look like you want that job. Uh, a bit more than if you're just sending out a generic cover letter. So acknowledge some of the things that were said in the job spec. And specifically, this is your the cover letter is your place where you motivate why they should even consider taking a look at your CV. And now, now the cover letter can usually be the email that you send your application with, or it could be a separate Word document that you put in the email that you send. The point is just uh, spend a bit of time tailoring it to that specific job spec. While I'm on the subject, the other thing that I can say was when you're writing your your uh, your cover letter is be realistic. Be realistic about what you can do, uh, what you can't do. Uh, when I applied for one of the jobs, I actually had a section in my cover letter saying why I am suited to this job and a paragraph titled why I might not be suited. And there I highlighted the things where I didn't have the experience that they were looking for, I didn't have a completely native speaker level of German, and I just wanted them to know for sure that that was what the situation was with me. So it felt kind of counterintuitive laying out my uh, <laughs> why, why they might not want to, to consider me. But the way I look at it is it's in the best interests of both parties. If they find that those things are not what they're looking for, 
They just don't invite me to the interview. They save themselves some time. They save me some time because I don't have to go and research the company some more and I don't have to prepare myself for an interview. So it's a win-win situation. So be realistic and honest in your cover letter. My next point, big international companies are a good place for you to start with in Germany. They already have an international culture and in many cases, they produce their internal communication in English. This is perfect. I know it's not perfect for people who might not have English as a native tongue, but even for people with other languages, quite often they have a very good level of English. So international companies are where it's at. Also, international companies have branches everywhere and there are jobs requiring certain languages within that company. For example, they might be looking for a salesperson to deal with the Spanish-speaking countries. And if you're a Spanish speaker, that's kind of perfect for you, especially if you're in sales. So the big companies provide a lot of international opportunities and also don't necessarily require German or English. They might have opportunities for you to use your own native tongue. Another thing, and this is a big one, I mentioned it briefly before in this episode, but you you need to have a LinkedIn and a Zing profile. Now, LinkedIn, you probably know, it's a massive career uh, social media site. Zing is the German version of that. So it's a sort of a social media network for professionals, but it's German-based. Uh, X-I-N-G, Zing.de. You need to have a profile on both LinkedIn and Zing. And if you're not big on social media... It doesn't matter. If you're looking for a job in Germany, this is no time to exercise your anti-social media policy. This is the time to get a job. Once you have a job, delete the profiles. It's fine. But just while you're getting that job, have a good profile with uh, your strengths, your experience, and uh, it could even be that headhunters or companies searching for suitable people find you. And also when you're sending your CVs into companies, what a lot of them do is they check on LinkedIn and zing.de to see if they can find your profile. And yeah, if they don't find you, it might not seem so professional. And you just want to give yourself every chance that you can. In line with something I mentioned earlier about being realistic, the same applies to interviews. I found that in interviews, Germans are not that into hyperbole. They just want to know the facts. And I find that an approach in a, in an interview with a German company of less about trying to impress them per se, but rather just to discuss the position. Go in there with an open mind and say, hey, let's discuss this position. This is what I can do. This is my experience. And then you can find out more about the position itself and what the, what the role entails. And it's more of a discussion, a, a two-way discussion. And I, th I think that works far better in German interviews than going in there with a sort of, I'm going to impress you. This is, this is why I'm so cool. Just tone it down a little, stick to the facts. And You also don't want to set yourself up for unrealistic expectations when you start the job. You know, you don't want them to think that you're able to do things that you can't do. So just be realistic. And the best interviews I had were the ones where I thought that I wouldn't actually get the job. And I went in thinking, you know what, I'm just going to be honest and see what happens. And that's, that worked, um, at least for me. But that's one of the things that I can kind of put forward as, as some advice. Next, you need to make an effort with the language. And this might mean that you start learning German a few months before you even start your job search. But it is crucial. And, or maybe not crucial. You can find jobs maybe without it. And a lot of people do. But it just puts you at so much of an advantage if you can speak some level of German. Even if your German is not good, at least to be able to show that you're taking steps towards learning it. And this means maybe preparing by do doing German courses at the A1 level. You won't be able to conduct the full interview uh, at an A1 German level, but you can at least go in and show your intent. My, my first interview was in German, or at least it, st it started in German, but it very soon switched later on once we got past all the things that I'd learned, which at that point was, Guten Tag, wie geht es Ihnen und ich heiße schon. That was it. But at least I could see my pronunciation was good and I, ha I was in the process of learning the German. So by that phase, uh, once they could see that, the, the interview kind of shifted over to English and it, it was fine. But it, it, it's important to be able to show that you are taking the initiative and learning German. About the interview process now, usually there's an initial interview Uh, and that one is usually with the direct line manager and involves the nitty gritty discussion about your experiences and about the job. 
And uh, quite often there's a second interview, but this is usually a formality, or at least I have uh, the experience that the second interview, if you make it to the second interview, it's kind of just a formality. And there you'll probably be discussing the conditions, negotiating a salary, and so on. So second interview is good. I have had job applications which went to a third interview, and I had one job application which had a what they called a schnupper tag, where you got to spend a day at the company with your team. You got you maybe put through some tasks that you need to provide. Cheryl spoke a bit about that. So that could also be part of your interview process, but I only had that in one of the interviews that I went to. The other thing I can mention is you probably need to have a clear idea of what salary you'll be asking for before you get into the interview. It's a difficult thing. It's very, very difficult for expats, especially if you're not in Germany at the moment or you have no idea about what your peers are earning or what you should be asking for. You might be inclined to start quite low just so that you can become an uh, attractive option for the job. But you really want to do your research about this and you want to do it before you get to the interview. So just kind of uh, ask around on Facebook. Uh, I also saw there's a a, uh, a website called Live Work Germany. And I'm putting the link in the blog post as well. And they just started a new series about what you can expect to ask for specific careers. And I think that the first one that they've done is the tech field, what you can kind of ask for salaries for different jobs in the tech field. Check that out, Live Work Germany. There's some good information there. And that is my advice, folks. I hope it's helped someone there. You know, it's something that I can talk about a lot. If you have specific questions for me about my experiences, please send me an email, expatlifegermany at gmail.com. And I'll, uh, I'll answer them either directly to you or maybe on a future episode of this podcast. Now, finally, to wrap this up, I've got some listener questions and also advice from listeners. I asked on uh, Expat Life Germany, my Facebook group, if any of the members there had some questions or advice. And uh, we, I got some responses. So here are some of the questions and advice that I got. Randolph uh, wrote, and this is his situation and his question. So this is Randolph writing. In America, it's quite common to get a degree in one subject and then work in a totally different sector, just because you somehow wound up in that job after college. From what I've heard, this is a bit less common in Germany. Now, uh, Randolph, I, I, I don't think it is less common. I, I've know, I know of quite a few people who studied one thing and ended up in a different field. It happens quite often with engineers. They study engineering and end up in software development or software architecture or some other kind of field. But I think it probably happens less than in places like USA or my home country of South Africa. But it, it's not uncommon. I would say. Randolph continued, my questions would be, is it odd for employers to see you have a degree in fine art, for example, but all your work experience is in corporate administration? Which field would you have better luck pursuing? Uh, Yeah, that's a good question, Randolph. I would say, depending on how desperate you are, pursue both or pursue with the one that you most want to get into. So maybe you've been working in corporate administration for so long. As I said earlier on, this is the time to reinvent yourself. Just try. Send applications for both and see what happens. If you're applying for the corporate administration stuff, um, you might need to provide stronger reference letters and um, any kind of certifications that you might have for that field. Because since your degree is in fine art and not related to corporate administration, you need to prove to them that you can do corporate administration. And in that case, you will need some good documentation to back up your claims or at least get you in the door. He also asks, do German firms prefer cold telephone calls, emails, knock at the office door and a friendly CV packet drop off? No. I would say not necessarily a friendly CV packet drop off, but definitely unsolicited applications are more than acceptable in Germany and in fact are very helpful. Just send your CV wherever. And I would not make cold telephone calls. I don't know if that's the correct advice to be giving, but my gut feel there is maybe not. It's better to just send them all the documents and let them have a look at it or just ignore it if they want to. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't say call them. So that was Randolph's question. Now, Ari, uh, who is also from the USA, if I'm not mistaken, she wrote a post on the Expat Life Germany Facebook page, not the group. And this was her question a few weeks ago. Hi. I'm beginning to look into job opportunities in Germany and a potential employer has requested a translation of my certificates by an authorized notary. Does anyone have any idea where I can find a reputable notary online? 
zentrale Stelle für ausländisches Bildungswesen has an option, but I'd like to find something more affordable. So I wrote back to Ari at this point and suggested that uh, I, I gave her a few links to some options online of places that would not only translate her documents, but also provide some kind of authorization. Um, and she wrote back saying, there's lots of options online. I'm just not sure if these translations would be accepted. Also, not sure how to find an authorized notary providing online services. There's a lot of gray areas. So that was a few weeks ago, and I decided for this episode, it might be something that other people who are looking for a job remotely might face. I followed up with her to find out how she resolved this problem, and she writes, I'm still in the process of applying for the job. I did some research online and found the Anerkennung in Deutschland website. I will include that website in the blog post. Since my field is a regulated profession, I need to have my degree translated and reviewed by a board to ensure equivalency. And I think this is something that a lot of job seekers might face. They might have documents from another country and you need to make sure that they mean the same thing in Germany. So the way that Ari did it, she continues here, I used a translator with a US-based office and they had the documents notarized as well to provide more formality. Another option was to have the degree assessed by the Central Office of Foreign Ed, ZAB, but this is expensive and I don't think necessary in my case. I will be sending this to the employer this week and hope it's enough. I'd love to hear, Ari, if it was enough. Yeah, or um, if there's another step, please uh, get back to me. Let me know. Finally, I have an audio recording from Rafael, who's originally from Brazil and living in Frankfurt. And yeah, this is his, he, he just had some advice for us. He has, he has his advice. Regarding looking for jobs in Germany, I would say to forget about LinkedIn and do a good profile at Xing. Uh, Xing is the LinkedIn used here in Germany, so to say, is a German website for job searching. And at least for the tech world, the hunters love to use it and for searching for new employees. And one more tip, uh, don't get me wrong, UK people, but I never have had a good experience uh, talking to hunters that are located in UK and were finding trying to find a job for me in Germany. So I don't know, just be careful. So what Raphael is saying is uh, you should favor the zing.de profile above the other, although my advice is try both, but make sure your zing.de is not neglected. And yeah, don't get involved with dodgy headhunters from the UK because they're probably not going to help you find a job here in Germany. So thanks for that, Raphael. So there you have it. As I mentioned a few times, there is a lot of information in the blog post for this show. So take a look at the show notes, click on the link there and go to the blog post and go through the resources that I've posted there. If you have tips of your own, join the Expat Life Germany Facebook group and let's have a discussion there. Also, feedback about this podcast, tips and anything else you have for me, just get in touch at expatlifegermany at gmail.com. Also, you can follow me on Instagram, Expat Life Germany, and on Twitter, Expat Life DE. Music that I used in this episode, Until the End by Ryan Anderson, Laid Back Fuzz by Poddington Bear, Daybreak by Chad Crouch, and the theme song, as always, is Devil in My Head, which is provided by my very own band, Tencent Janes. Auf Wiederhören! <laughs> <laughs>